a generation of students committed to saving the planet. It's constantly changing. Like we're living in an earth that like humans have never lived in before, just because of how high carbon dioxide is and like all the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Inspired by the work of others. The loss of our marine ecosystems, it is the invisible crisis, and yet it's such a critical one. The fact that there's, you know, actively growing corals here off of Miami and still some pretty amazing reefs that you can find in the Florida Keys are a testament to me to the fact that we've still got everything to play for. From wildfires in the West. It creates its own weather, dark, gloomy, the winds. There was some very much heroism on the nights of these evacuations. To rising waters on the coastline. It's gonna wipe us out. I mean, the oysters are not gonna like it around here. I mean, it's gonna be too fresh for them. You know, you need, you need a certain salinity for oysters to survive. Young people dedicated to making a difference. I think it's really important to get out in nature and just kind of remind yourself why you're fighting. You're fighting for this beautiful environment. Before is too late. Zero hour, climate change in the U.S. Next. Many people don't think water is alive or has a spirit. My people believe this to be true. We believe our water is sacred because we are born of water and live in water for nine months. All the original water flows through us from the beginning and all around us. One day I will be an ancestor and I want my great grandchildren to know I tried hard to fight so they can have clean drinking water. We need to work together and empower each other to take a stand for our planet. We need to sustain the little we have now and develop ways not to pollute the environment and sustain relationships with Mother Earth and save what we have left. Let's not let water and Mother Earth down. This could very well be the future for large parts of the United States. They are labeled superfires, able to devour hundreds of thousands of acres of trees and anything that stands in their path. These flames are fanned by prolonged drought and arise in global temperatures. Scientists tell us it's climate change. And everyone says these fires take on a life of their own. It creates its own weather, dark, gloomy, the winds. You got winds blowing from this way, you got winds blowing from this way. It's exactly like a tornado effect. 140 or so kilometers northwest of Denver, Grand County Sheriff, Brett Schrotland saw first responders pushed to their limit at the East Troublesome Fire. Had you ever experienced anything like what you went through in 2020? We always plan for the worst. We plan for the worst of the worst, but 2020 was the, the worst of the worst of the worst. In just one evening, October 21st, the forest fire, which had been moving slowly, instantly gained strength fanned by strong winds. Bone-dry conditions fed the flames, allowing the fire to spread treetop to treetop. Let's go. Traffic, just go now. Just get, go, get out. There was some very much heroism on the nights of these evacuations. We have five minutes to get out of this neighborhood or you're not gonna have an accident. We have body cam footage of some of our officers um, praying that they're actually gonna get to see their, uh, their son Later on, as you can see, the flames rolling over the front of his patrol car. Please help me get out of here so I can be a dad to my son. Lord Jesus, please help us. I didn't know if we were going to die, but I knew that that was a very real possibility at that point. Deputy Aaron Trainer did live to tell the tale. 
And as we went into that meadow, I heard, you know, it's everybody's poured gas or some sort of fuel source on a fire. And that, that, but a thousand acre meadow, um, instantaneously. And this wall of fire came across, crossed the road, blew up the hillside. This is what the East Troublesome Fire did to the forest of Grand County, Colorado. Three hundred and seventy homes reduced to this. And in all, nearly 200,000 acres burned. In this era of climate change, the big question, what happens to forests after they burn? Until 2020, this was the site of the largest wildfire in Colorado's history. It's called the Hayman Fire and happened just outside of Colorado Springs. Over this massive area, no pine or fir trees have come back in nearly 20 years. You know, I used to work up here for years. It's exciting and fun to come when I... Marin Chambers is with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute at Colorado State University. As a researcher, I have a lot of interest and intrigue in the fire impacts, the fire effects, and really my biggest area of interest is future forests and how forests recover following these large-scale disturbances. What researchers have found to a large extent is that in many areas, the ponderosa pines and other fir trees aren't coming back. I think there's multiple factors there. Um, it's climate change, it's human management, it's the way that we have suppressed fires for over a hundred years. I think there's a bunch of compounding factors, but I think climate change is certainly a component. The high intensity Hayman fire devastated nearly 140,000 acres. Replanting that acreage by hand is out of the question. Scientists are focusing on other key issues brought on by climate change. The questions really are, what do we do before a fire like this happens to avoid these very large fires since we know we're experiencing changes in temperature and drought? We know that we're probably experiencing already Im impacts of climate change. We are now in Aspen, some 400 kilometers northwest of the Hayman Fire. Adam McCurdy, the forest and climate director of the nonprofit Environmental Education Foundation, the Aspen Center, walks us through the aftermath of yet another major blaze. You know, this is one tree of 12,000 acres here, yeah. 200,000 acres in East Troublesome. Mm -hmm. So you add that up and you really get a sense of you know, how damaging this really is. Mm -hmm. Once we have those hotter, drier years, uh, heat pulls more moisture out of our ecosystems, out of the soil. It leads to increased drought and it sets the stage for, for more fires. Are you worried about that becoming the norm? Totally, yeah. I mean, I, I, I look around where we are and I see forests that are similar to the forests that burned on the Front Range that are these subalpine forests that have not adapted to fire. We have to come to grips with the fact that our actions have changed the landscape and it's not gonna be like it was. Do you think people believe that? It's getting harder and harder to deny what's right in front of us. I think even the most strident climate deniers out here have trouble saying that it hasn't gotten warmer and it hasn't gotten drier and we don't have more fires.
Every Tuesday, John Kormacher leads a few scientists 11,000 feet to a research area in the Medicine Bow Mountains on the Colorado-Wyoming border. It's called the Glacier Lakes Ecosystem Experiment Site, or GLEES. The GLEES project began in the 1980s when the major concern was acid rain. The burning of fossil fuels triggered highly acidic rainfall that was killing trees and squeezing the life out of lakes. In his work with the U.S. Forest Service, Kormacher has been a witness to change in the environment. You have noticed it's getting hotter in the summer? We've noticed a, an increase. An average summer is now about 1.7 degrees Celsius hotter than it was uh, in the mid-1980s, which is, as uh, temperature trends grow, is a very steep curve. What does that tell you? Um, well, it, it tells me, well, very definitely it's getting hotter up here. Um, and I think uh, we'll eventually start seeing changes in the length of the growing season. Huge sections of the forest are dead or dying. The trees are being hit by a little insect, no bigger than a grain of rice, called the spruce beetle. This beetle targets trees in high altitudes. Forest ecologist Kate Dwyer says the beetle's tree of choice here is the Engelmann spruce. It is gigantic. How old, roughly, do you think it is? This tree is, is probably at least 600 years old, maybe older. Um, our, our oldest sort of grandfather trees up here at Glacier Lakes are, are in the 700 um, range. As much as 90% of this forest was killed by the beetle, adding up to a lot of fuel for a potential fire. We're fortunate because this the growing season at this site is really short, which means the potential fire season is really short. Dwyer says by checking rings on trees, it shows there has not been a major fire in this area at this altitude in hundreds of years. But with warmer temperatures, researchers are worried about a severe fire here now, in large part because the beetle is not done killing. This is what gives many forest researchers hope. More than 350 kilometers south of the Colorado-Wyoming border, we are back near Colorado Springs. And we are in the Hayman Fire on the Pike National Forest in a portion of the fire that burned with low to moderate yeah, severity. Like in this section of the fire, um, the, the fuel conditions were probably the same, the forest structure, but the weather was much less severe. And so the fire burned with a much less severe behavior. This section of the forest is much healthier. It's also managed to avoid a severe burn. There is robust ground growth and trees are spread out, less fuel to feed a major blaze. When I see those thick forest um, at this elevation, I think, oh, that's, that's just waiting for either the bugs or a fire to come through. So I think to the untrained eye, like, I thought, well, that looks great. But explain why that is. They're so dense that from a fire standpoint, um, it would be easy for a fire to jump from crown to crown. And these, these ponderosa pine trees and Douglas fir trees do not like fire in their crowns. It kills them. Um, think about your garden. So you, you plant 100 tomato seeds, you don't grow 100 tomatoes. Um, you thin them out, right? Because you want them to be able to, to grow well and not be susceptible to drought and, and resource limitations. It has been a brutal few years for foresters in the face of rising temperatures and drought. But forest management is providing a ray of hope as scientists try to gain the upper hand on damage from severe fires throughout the world. I think that climate change is one of the biggest existential threats that we face, and it's 
a tragedy that it has not been addressed so far, despite long-standing evidence that shows the world is warming and it's doing so to the detriment of millions of people. Fires are getting hotter, more destructive, hurricanes are worsening, um, and beyond that, heat across the United States and the world more broadly will impact and kill so many people if we do not do something to combat it. Which is up ahead. So it's a specific part of the school that's just for students. And it's where we have a lot of our um, student organizations and academic journals that allow us. Julia Whitehead studies law at the University of California, Berkeley. I essentially came to law school because I worked in renewable energy um, and I focused on various international development initiatives. So adopting policies that can promote um, additional electric vehicles or the use of alternative fuels would be a huge way to actually enact change. And a lot of that will happen by policymakers and potentially by lawyers who stand up in court and litigate and say, this policy, the current policy is wrong. And you're able to see that to an extent right now with some of the active ongoing cases brought by cities against big oil, um, saying big oil knew that the use of oil and gas causes climate change. They knew this like decades ago and they did nothing to stop it. In fact, they deliberately took the information and, and they quashed it <laughs> in order to continue to sell oil. And so a lot of cities right now are suing for abatement costs and lawyers have a really big role in bringing those cases, arguing those cases and having them take an active role in fighting for policies and, and laws that can genuinely create a livable environment, not just for 10 years, but for 100. And I think that is one of the biggest ways that lawyers and law students can come together and, and make a difference by advocating for these policies. A lot of this actually is from um, pre-pandemic, like all of these people graduated. So it's kind of weird. And we have like a 2020 calendar or 2019 calendar. As a member um, and board member of Ecology Law Quarterly, I recently organized this past spring a wildfire symposium. I think some of the key takeaways were the importance of collaboration between both tribal communities, uh, the, fe the federal lands management in, in the state entities, the importance of understanding the bureaucratic barriers that might be in place that could prevent a more effective method of fire management. Prescribed burns, for example, um, requires a, a lot of bureaucracy in order to get that approved. On top of it, it requires some larger changes um, more effective legislation to prevent climate change, which is exacerbating the severity of the fires. Policies that allow brush, especially in California, to be cleared more effectively um, so that the fires, when they burn, don't burn as hot, as severe, or a, of a magnitude that is uncontrolled. There are a number of ways that students become more involved in advocating for changes that can prevent climate change. Um, obviously, becoming educated on the topic, being able to speak intelligently, that's I think one of the best ways students can become involved. They are the future. And I think that's um, once someone is educated on the concept of climate change, on the, the true issues behind it, they can take that forward when they start their career. If they join a Fortune 500 company and they're the marketing director, even though that might seem very tangential to affecting change in a meaningful manner, they can choose to take on issues and, and support policies that can create a more sustainable environment for everyone. If the world doesn't do enough to combat climate change, we'll end up in a much more insecure world. There will be droughts, mass displacement, um, there will be loss of, of property and, and more significantly of, of life across the globe. And it's not going to be restricted 
to um, some of the nations that are being most impacted right now. It's going to be impacting everyone across all countries, across all socioeconomic classes, and it's going to be pretty devastating. And we have the opportunity right now to make policy changes that can mitigate those impacts. And so it's one of the most important areas where we can genuinely change today to improve life for the better in the future. It's got many names. Native Americans call it the father of waters. The Mississippi is also called Old Man River. And by some, the big muddy for all the sediment that flows south. It was this mud and sand that built the expansive Mississippi Delta, land that is sinking as surrounding waters rise. My name is Captain George Ricks. Uh, I own and operate getaway fishing charters out of Hopedale, Louisiana. Slow down a little bit, Steve. You ain't fishing plastic now, you're fishing live bait. We catch uh, uh, a variety of saltwater species. Mm -hmm. But our, our, our target species, which is our number one, um, which attracts all of our recreational fishermen is a speckled trout. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a red. But this is not purely salt water. The area, rich in fish, crab, oysters, and shrimp, is an estuary. What an estuary is, is a delicate balance of fresh and salt water. That would, that's what makes our water so fertile. Uh, do we need fresh water in an estuary? Absolutely. Do we need salt water in an estuary? Absolutely. It's that delicate balance, that mixture, that makes this, this, this estuary what it is, makes our fishing and our seafood industry so, so outstanding. In his 70s now, with no sign of slowing down, clients trust their day on the water to Rick's. You know, I started fishing when I was six years old. My, my father fished before me. He, 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 he caught crabs and, and fished, and, and his father before him. In his years on the water, he's seen Louisiana's delicate coastline wash away. By all accounts, this region is losing a football field worth of marshlands every 100 minutes. Every year you come out, you see less and less land. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, right, right, right here, there was an island two years ago. There was an island right there. It's gone now. We all know what's happening. We see what's happening every day. Let me ask you a bit about climate change. Do you think people down here have had their attitudes change in the last 15, 20 years about climate change? Listen, I, I see, it. We, we, we see it every day. We're out here every day and everybody knows things are changing. You know, our, our hurricanes are getting more frequent and more powerful every year. Shortly after this interview, Hurricane Ida hit the Louisiana coast hard. Its most punishing winds and storm surge sweeping through the very marshlands Rick's works. Scientists say it is climate change at its most devastating. The river built the land that we're standing on, built New Orleans, built all of southern Louisiana, but we live on a river delta. And what river deltas do geologically is they sink over time. It's a natural process. But there was nothing natural about the process that choked off the flow of sediment and fresh water from the Mississippi into the Delta some 80 years ago. Just above New Orleans, Louisiana. It was a series of dams and levees built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The treatment, concrete paving for the levee. Kimberly Davis Rayer is with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. The CPRA is pushing a plan to breathe new life into this sensitive area by something called sediment diversion. 
New Orleans sits on the Mississippi River between Lake Pontchartrain and the Gulf of Mexico, what we call the Bird's Foot Delta. In years past, this river would overflow its banks in the spring, in the fall, in the times when the water was high. And the water and sediment that flowed out of the river would build land, nourish the wetlands. When we levied this river, we stopped that flow of sediment and water from the river into the wetlands. So it basically choked off the, the potential growth. Choked off the potential growth and essentially starved the wetlands from the water and the sediment that they need to, to be healthy, to thrive, to grow. The sediment diversion is planned for a spot 60 miles up the river, would simply reconnect the river to the adjacent wetlands. The idea is it'll be controlled, it'll be open when the river is high, when the river is most full of sediment, when it's most efficient to do this. Diverting the Mississippi into the wetlands is the centerpiece of a $50 billion plan to restore Louisiana's coastline. It will help cope with the ills of climate change, since wetlands knock down a storm surge. The only reason the diversion plan is even on the table is the direct result of the BP Horizon disaster that claimed 11 lives and fouled much of the region with oil. Four billion dollars of BP settlement money is earmarked to restore the coastal wetlands. Alicia Renfro is a coastal scientist with the National Wildlife Federation, one of a host of environmental groups that is strongly backing the diversion plan. You know, I think uh, for a long time we've recognized that something needs to be done in Louisiana. Uh, the oil spill kind of highlighted what's got happening in the Gulf Coast, but particularly in Louisiana. And so I think most people, it just makes sense when you talk about the river built this landscape. The river is the only thing that is going to sustain it for the long term. They're talking about, at best, in 50 years, building 13,000 acres. That's a spot on the map about this big. That'll do nothing for this area here. We're going to continue to lose land, even with the diversion. But what it will do, it will eliminate our resources. Ricks is among those fighting the state's big plans to save the wetlands. People who make a living on the water say by upsetting the delicate balance, there's the risk of destroying the environment that is so important for fishing, crabbing, shrimpers, and oystermen. This is Granal, and we're going to go look at an a oyster farm. Um, a few years ago, oysterman Boris Guerrero bet big on setting up his oyster farm. The water here has been perfect to grow a juicy, tasty oyster. Let's do a taste test. Good? Delicious. The salinity went up. But the state's plan to divert the Mississippi is leaving a bad taste in his mouth. Let's take that to its logical conclusion. If indeed they open this up and pump in a lot of fresh water, what is it going to do to you and other oystermen down here in Grand Isle? Uh, it's going to wipe us out. I mean, the oysters are not going to like it around here. I mean, it's going to be too fresh for them. You know, you need, you need a certain salinity for oysters to survive. And, uh, and, and maybe if they, if they do survive, how much percent of the year will have an uh, oyster that has no taste, for example? It's really a bad, <laughs> a bad scenario either way you see it. And there's one more variable at play. The tourism industry really keeps New Orleans afloat in many ways. Richard Hughes has owned and operated the famed Pelican Club in the French Quarter for more than 30 years. Losing the flavor of the Gulf, he says, will hit the tourism industry hard. I think it would be catastrophic. I really do. I'd put all these fisheries out of business and then expect them to come back when they turn the switch on again. That's not a really realistic scenario. Some $300 million is set aside for what's called mitigation, helping shrimpers, fishermen, and others financially deal with the changes caused by diversion. It, it's, it's a culture and a heritage. What, kind, what price do you put on that? You know, you can't put a price on, on generations of, of what they've done. 
it's not simple. This is really complicated. It's messy. There are a lot of people involved. Um, there are real concerns. Th th this is going to cause challenges for certain people, and it's really important we recognize that. Above all, supporters of the plan come back to one key argument. Do nothing, and all this eventually washes away. I would say embrace the opportunity. We need to look at this as a chance for Louisiana to lead, a chance for us to, to find a way to live here safely, even if it means some change. And also, it's important that we all recognize status quo is not an option. Things are going to change. We need to decide how we want them to change. I think it's really important to get out in nature and just kind of remind yourself why you're fighting. You're fighting for this beautiful environment. And I love to get outside. I love to go hiking. Um, my dad was always taking pictures growing up, so I love photography and taking pictures of nature. And I hope in the future that I can spend a lot more time in national parks. At a very young age, my parents instilled a love of nature and a respect for nature. And so I always grew up uh, really interested in animal conservation, and I think that naturally just turned into a passion for climate conservation and environmental justice. But I really think for, for me at least, the 2016 elections and seeing how important it was to see our elected officials care about climate change really changed my perspective and my sense of urgency for climate and environmental justice. The youth have taken a stand. The term activist is changing, uh, I think, what we used to think of just one or two people in a movement as the sole activist, but now anybody can be an activist. For me, activism is uh, a term defined as someone who is taking care of communities, whether they're a part of them or not. And I would love to be considered an activist or an organizer in any way. I've been organizing um, and working in environmental activism for the last five years. I started when I was 16 in Dallas, and now that I've moved to the Washington, D.C. area, I'm very involved here. Uh, I also think that there's other avenues. Molly Reed is a political science student at George Mason University. For me, researching environmental justice through policy is very important. I'm also working in the climate department, actually. I've worked there for two years. I go to George Mason and my, I'm lucky to go to a school that's very passionate about environmental justice. So we have a greenhouse on campus where we grow some of the produce that we use in the dining hall. We have food forest, we have wildflower um, beds that allow the indigenous plants of the area to grow. We have wildlife um, opportunities. So we have beehives and some of those food forests also offer a place for the natural bees and bug population to grow. We also have some great forested areas that connect students to nature. And we also have incredible um, composting and recycling opportunities on campus. So this is the place on campus where we really want bugs because um, they help break down all the food waste. And so you'll hear a lot of crickets and you'll see some flies and that's actually a really good thing. At my university, we actually have personal compost that we can use. So I like to put coffee grounds or any fruit peels, banana peels. You can see some sort of melon um, in there. And I think, you know, collectively as a whole, if we as a society composted a lot more than we do, we'd save so much food waste from the landfills. There's a couple of these and you kind of open it up. You put whatever you want in there. Um, so you can see some banana peels and then you'll put something on top of it um, to help it break down. So usually like paper bags or leaves, sticks, things like that. And you just shovel, shuffle it up and then you start turning this. And it's not wanting to move. Yeah, it's not really wanting to move. It's too full to move. <laughs> well, that's good. People are using it.
we don't need everyone to drop what they're doing and just focus on this issue. What we do need is everyone to prioritize climate justice in some way, shape or form. Whether that looks like them going out to a protest or calling their representatives or having a conversation with their family on how they can lower their carbon emissions. Or it might be just reading the news, reading more articles about climate justice. It's very overwhelming, but there's so many little things that we can do and just taking that first step Telling yourself that you want to prioritize learning about environmental justice, that's the first step and that goes a long way. Clear, clear. You know, when we see the, the forest fires in California, it's very visible to everybody. It's, it's topside, it's on the news, it's very easy to get footage of it and to share that footage with the world. The loss of our marine ecosystems, it is, it is the invisible crisis, and yet it's such a critical one. Alice Granger, with an organization called the Coral Restoration Foundation, is talking about the loss of coral reef systems around the world. They are being decimated globally and rapidly. The biggest threat to coral reefs is climate change. There's no doubt about it. All of the science is there. Perhaps nowhere is the loss more painfully obvious than off the Florida Keys, where 98% of the reef system is dead. Just a slight uptick in water temperature is to blame for the widespread mortality. All right, you want to grab some tubs? Yeah. And I'll get some epoxy in here. Out planning sheets. This is a scene that plays out three or so times a week at the Key Largo headquarters of the Coral Restoration Foundation, or CRF. Scientists Alex Neufeld right. and Dan Berdano are getting ready for a day in the water. Both caught the diving bug at an early age. Now Dan and Alex are becoming leaders in the field, and their research could help reefs all over the world. Coral reefs occupy only 1% of the sea floor but they're home to about 25% of marine species. So they are, you know, even beyond the rainforests of the sea in terms of a biodiversity standpoint. They also provide the protein source for about a billion people worldwide. Just give me a thumbnail sketch of what the reef situation is off the coast of Florida. Yeah, so the, the Florida Coral Reef Tract is a very heavily degraded reef. Um, we've had detrimental effects going on you know, since the 70s for, for decades. Um, whether it's effects from climate change and warming water temperatures, whether it's local stressors you know, due to pollution and or development and sedimentation. And so what this means is that our reefs are now primarily just rocky seafloor. Good to go. At a depth of fewer than 10 meters, these artificial trees are the key to the Coral Restoration Foundation's success. You're looking at healthy staghorn and elkhorn coral two of the fastest growing corals in the world. They are thriving, being cultured just off Florida's coast. Essentially, we want to provide 360 degrees of nutrients for the corals. Sunlight, but also water flow in the column. And so how do we get the corals hanging mid-water in the water column? How do we make sure that they're happy? When they have their polyps out, they look kind of fuzzy. You know, a fuzzy coral is a happy coral. It's got all its little tentacles out. Um, that means it's not only is it is the algae photosynthesizing, but the coral is actually feeding as well in the water column. You saw the largest offshore coral tree nursery anywhere in the world. Thousands of individual coral colonies, all of endangered species, that we work with on a daily basis. Corals are animals. They have mouths and feed with tentacles. They have a symbiotic relationship with algae, and this unique partnership allows coral to flourish. Through photosynthesis, the algae not only provide coral with enough food to grow, it also provides oxygen and removes waste. 
they are amazing creatures. So if we lose the coral reefs, which is what we're facing without immediate action, without working to mitigate and reverse the effects of climate change, we're taking out you know, a, a keystone component of our oceans. And you know, humanity has never before faced the loss of an entire ecosystem you know, in the whole history of our species. Coral has had to cope with disease and pollution. Warming oceans are stressing coral around the world. It leads to bleaching, and if temperatures remain too warm too long, this bleaching kills coral. When the coral gets too hot, the algae actually overproduces, and that you know, the coral senses that as a problem, it senses that as a foreign body. And essentially what's called coral bleaching is a stress response. The coral restoration team clips a bit of staghorn and elkhorn coral from the trees, leaving a healthy portion to continue to grow. It will be harvested on another day. This hard surface where scientists plant the coral using adhesive is actually a dead reef. The hard substrate took thousands of years to develop and in places, sadly, only a few decades to be destroyed. But life is starting to bloom here again. In 2021, CRF hopes to plant 40,000 staghorn and elkhorn coral. You know, you guys, what, 40,000 you say you hope to do this year? Is that enough or is it simply scratching the surface? It is simply scratching the surface, but it represents a monumental shift from where we came from. And so in that regard, it is more than enough because it gets us into a space where suddenly 50,000 a year doesn't seem far-fetched. At the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, University of Miami professor Andrew Baker is making efforts to restore coral reefs his life's work. Coral reef restoration is going to be just like reforestation, where the results of our efforts in 2021 are not really going to be seen until 2040, 2050, so it's definitely a long term. Baker spends less time in the water these days and more time in his research labs. Baker and his team of young scientists are trying to, in essence, cross-breed coral from warmer waters with staghorn coral from Florida's coast. The goal is to create a coral that will survive the ills of climate change and take root here. If there's something that keeps me up at night, it, it's, the, it's the idea that um, we could be working, we, we are working so hard on saving these ecosystems consisting of these tiny little organisms that are so exceptionally environmentally vulnerable and we may ultimately fail. This is not a, an, a business to be in if you're not an optimist and I'm definitely a glass half full sort of a person. I, I never give up hope. The fact that there's you know, actively growing corals here off of Miami and still some pretty amazing reefs that you can find in the Florida Keys are a testament to me to the fact that we've still got everything to play for. The problem with climate change is obviously it's a global phenomenon. It's, and it's very indirect. Actions that someone can have thousands of miles from the nearest coral reefs ultimately have this impact on these reef ecosystems that are in such a delicate balance. In 2017, Hurricane Irma was the most powerful storm to hit the continental United States since Katrina, more than a decade earlier. Okay, so this is, this is what the area looked like pre-Irma. So if we zoom in here, okay. we can see, you know, some really nice um, thickets of, of staghorn that we had on this ledge. And then Irma came through, and this is what that same ledge looks like with the same corals, just tiny little bases left. 
So we went from something you know, that looked like this, and then this little line of, of corals right here. Another sign, scientists say, that climate change is bringing more fierce storms more often. When you first saw this after the hurricane, what went through your mind? Oh, it was, I mean, I wasn't sure I wanted to keep working at CRF, to be honest. That, you know, something could happen like that that you have no control over. And the last, you know, 10 years worth of work on this site was just gone. But Neufeld stayed. And so did other young scientists. Then more researchers came. So we got through that, but in the moment, I think it really impressed upon us the scale of the fight that we have because there is so much potentially that is out of our control. Despite all the challenges, Alex still has hope they will win the race against climate change. My name is Katherine Howe, and I am a senior at George Mason University. I am studying environmental science with a concentration in human and ecosystem response to climate change. I co-founded a Sunrise uh, chapter here at Mason, and the, it was started during the pandemic in 2020, or over the summer. So once fall hit, we were able to have that running. And it was more so to get Mason students to come join and be a part of like the climate movement and help enact the change because I personally didn't realize that like my voice mattered and that I can do and change things. And I sat in Nancy Pelosi's office and I got arrested for that. So that was my first really like experience with that. But that is only like my real arrest from climate change. But like I'm happy to be involved because like I do recognize and acknowledge that I am very privileged in m many ways. And so knowing that I was born in the States, having the financial like opportunity to do that, like, yeah, I'll do it. I know I am only like one person and one, one voice, but like, it only takes one person to really enact change and like instill that like, oh, I can also change and help make people also realize that and know that they're not alone. The reason we are able to predict climate for the next 100 years is because we have good climate models that simulate the current 100 years very well. And the point of like dynamic models is using previous data that we've collected and like used from like ice core or, or other cores from the earth, carbon data and stuff like that. And I think those are really accurate. At least like they can try to like predict the future and they have done a, a good job so far. And especially like technology keeps on like improving and advancing. They consider so many different factors and try to account for that and also not compress, but like using all the different factors, compiling it together and trying to predict this is what it could really look like in the future. And I think that's so cool. I think a lot of times people are always talking about like my kids and my kids' kids and stuff like that. And if we don't enact like change now, we're the future is not going to be improving and advancing. It's constantly changing. Like we're living in an earth that like humans have never lived in before, just because of how hard, how high carbon dioxide is and like all the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We are currently at George Mason's wetland. I am currently um, a part of Environmental 350, EVPP 350, and that's um, freshwater ecosystems. And so I've done field work there and I really enjoy it. I, I was on a boat last week and then we're gonna be here um, looking at the wetlands here and like evaluating it. So I really enjoy that class. I've also been in like microbiology and different like labs here at Mason. Um, I'm also planning to volunteer with the USGS and see like their pollinator lab. So I'm pretty excited about that. But yeah, I, I really look forward to the different field work I can work with. I 
I think sea level rise and the increased temperature and the more severe and intense uh, weather patterns that we're seeing. It's not only like a human related issue that like climate does impact us, but more so the ecosystem and the biodiversity that we have here and that we have already lost so many species, but we can do more and prevent that. So I think that's important. I do encourage like people who do think it climate change is a hoax to kind of like find scientific evidence and because the point of science and data is to like whatever we collect it's there and then analyze it and see what does the results mean and what does that entail and I think going from there you can be like oh, okay so I shouldn't really believe it's this because I read this and kind of have that like base science base behind it. Yeah, it is frustrating because there are people who have been in the field for so long and have like studied about it. It's frustrating because we've known for so long, but also we haven't really enacted meaningful change and like it's still occurring and it's still getting worse in some ways. I think being able to have like a large influence or voice to be like, guys, we really need to do this about climate change and really have that I think that would be really beneficial and I also want to kind of like help others identify misinformation because with the internet and how fast it's like evolved and stuff like that we don't really know how to like deal with it and so I think combating misinformation and also putting scientific information that's not biased and stuff like that and have that out and available to the public I think that's very important. Yeah, it is scary. I mean, but I, I also know that it's good to be hopeful because if we have the mindset of being hopeful, then we can tackle it better. Back in Colorado, Sheriff Brett Schrotlin and his crew learned the lessons a massive fire taught them and are ready to respond to the next fire call. You're listening to officers on the radio you're listening to our under sheriff and our lieutenants uh, make these super fast life-saving decisions. It's organized chaos. Our team has a plan, um, but everybody is doing whatever they can to save lives, and they're putting their lives at risk to save lives, which in law enforcement we do every day. But that was really, really touching for me, was that you watch these guys that knew that there was someone in an area that they needed to get to, and they would do whatever it could to get to that person. Professor Andrew Baker continues to look for innovative methods to speed up the coral restoration process. I think most people who are working in coral restoration recognize that corals take a long time to grow and the fruits of their labor are not going to be seen uh, for decades. So it's a leap of faith that the actions that we'll do, that we're taking right now, will translate into increased survivorship and increased coral cover on reefs in the areas that we're doing. But what else would we do? Um, you know, we, I think we have to begin this process. In Louisiana, Boris Guerrero clings to hope in spite of the challenges he and his fellow oystermen will have to face. I just hope people maybe give us a different options. You know, I mean, one, one size doesn't fit all. So let's, let's try to, let's try to you know, come up with uh, different ideas that can help us you know, navigate this while re restoring uh, the land. It's very scary to know that that can happen and, and, and it's hard to see a future on it. Uh, but you know, we, we still optimist about this and, and, and we love what we do and that's why we're still here. While in Virginia, Molly Reed is hoping to graduate soon and work on legislation to address climate change. So I'm hoping that in the next five years I complete my JD and then find a way that I can help write some of the legislation that we're seeing in Congress and actually consider how we can, as a, as a government, as, as a country, take more legislative actions for climate justice. So I would love 10 years from now um, to be working with Congress on the Hill with elected officials and creating legislation that can actually make a difference for our society. I think at the end of the day, everyone in power has a responsibility to fight for climate change. It's really easy, especially in America, to try to blame one party or the other, but 
In reality, we need everyone as an elected official to fight for climate change. We need everyone. We need every American and every person on this planet fighting for climate change.